Prabhu. Uh, Radhika Ramanan Prabhu, his uh, Karmi name is Dr. Ravi Gupta, and he is uh, the Charles Red Professor of Religious Studies and Department Head for History at U Utah State University in USA. He is the author of various four books, including uh, Bhagavad Puran, which is written uh, with uh, Krishna Chitra Maharaj and published by Columbia University Press. Radhika Raman Prabhu has received four teaching awards, a National Endowment for Humanities Summer Fellowship and three research fellowships of a book award. He is a permanent research fellow for Oxford Central Center for Hindu Studies and has been a past president for Society for Hindu Christian Studies. He grew up in Idaho in a city known as Boise, where his parents uh, was running ISKCON Center. He earned his bachelor's degree in mathematics and philosophy from Boise State University and went uh, to complete his master's and PhD at the age of 22 from Oxford University in England. He later on uh, taught at University of Florida, a uh, center college in Kentucky and the College of William and Mary in Virginia. In 2008, he met Pope Benedict um, 10, uh, that is 15, I think, I'm sorry, 16 on behalf of Hindus in America during uh, the brief visit of Pope in the United States. Radhika Raman Prabhu is a disciple of Hanumat Preksha Swami and he serves on GBC Sastric Advisory Council as well as BBT's editorial review panel. He is currently living in Utah uh, in the USA with his family. So we are very fortunate to have his, his grace Radhika Raman Prabhu um, between us and sharing his uh, piece of knowledge with all, us, all of us. Thank you Prabhuji. Please take it over. Um, Hare Krishna, thank, thank you so, so much, much for the very kind introduction. Recording in progress. Um, it's a real um, pleasure to be here uh, today, and um, I see many familiar faces uh, of devotees I've seen recently. Pran Govinda Pru, Hare Krishna, Bhakti Prabhav Maharaj, Hare Krishna, many others also. Um, so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak about the Upanishads. This was the topic I was asked uh, to speak on and um, our time together is uh, about two hours uh, and um, um, I'm hoping that we have substantial time within that for uh, discussions, uh, questions and interaction as well. Um, if at any point during the session you have a um, uh, a question or a thought or a comment, then please use uh, the raise hand feature in Zoom and that'll um, alert me that you're, uh, you, you have something uh, to contribute and uh, I will pause my, um, my discussion here. There are some points during which I'll share my screen, we'll read some passages from the Upanishads together um, and also some points at which I'll uh, request your input on on um, understanding a particular passage. Uh, so, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, this is uh, um, a real uh, honor to be here and to be in your association. Okay. I think I have one request. Uh, yes. In India today, it's a Sunday evening, and uh, I will request you to go ahead and you know complete the session on time because. Uh, especially on Sunday evening, we have uh, all the leaders are uh, connected with the temple and they have uh, all the guests coming in. So uh, I will request your humble uh, request. Please, if possible, please end the session on time with question and answers. Uh, at least for today, uh, we don't request this on other days, but today being a Sunday and you understand. We have a lot of guests in the temple and uh, without wasting further time, please take it on. Yes, yes, no problem, Prabhu. I'll, I'll make a note of that. Om Jnana Timiran Dhasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesh Shunyavadi Paschati Deshatarine 
जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री द्वैत गदाधर शिवासादि गौर भक्त बिंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे वाछा कल्पतुभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पति पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम so for the upanishads um i want to begin by reminding us of a, a wonderful episode in shri chaitanya charitamrita when shri chaitanya mahaprabhu goes to varanasi to kashi there um the uh, <coughs> excuse me there the uh, uh the uh, he meets with the mayavadi sanyasis led by prakashananda saraswati and in the course of that conversation one of the things that prakashananda saraswati says is that um he says you know the fact that you are chanting the hari krishna mantra this is very good we appreciate this we uh we understand that this is beneficial uh for the common masses but why don't you take the time to study vedanta Uh, that this is the duty of a sanyasi, and we are disappointed that you don't join us for the study of Vedanta. Now, when he says Vedanta, of course, what he's referring to is Vedanta Sutra, but even more so, uh, he is referring to the Upanishads, uh, because the Upanishads are Vedanta. Uh, if we think of um, uh, Veda and Anta. uh meaning the end of the vedas and the word anta or end here can be taken in two senses a uh, one sense is that it is it comes at the end of the vedas meaning that it comes after the vedas so in any collection of vedic scriptures uh, you'll have the four vedic samhitas and after each samhita then you'll have the aranyakas and the brahmanas that go with it and finally the upanishads so in the collection of a uh, veda the the last one that uh, that comes is is in that sequence are, are the upanishads so in a literal sense in a physical sense the Ve- the upanishads come at the end of the vedas but more important than that literal sense is end in the sense of purpose or goal just like uh, in english we might say what is the end of life uh, on one hand the wor- the end of life is death that's just a, a physical reality but on another level uh, when in a philosophical sense the end of life means the purpose of life the goal of life then we can say this krishna consciousness or it is liberation so in s- the same way anta here in in sanskrit has these two senses the physical end of the vedas but also the purpose of the vedas and the upanishads are revealing the purpose uh the 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 knowledge embedded within the vedas <clears throat> and so when we speak of vedanta we mean the upanishads uh, that is the the fundamental sense and then vedanta sutra uh, or the brahma sutra is basically a commentary on the upanishads um the the vedanta sutra is in itself not an independent work uh the vedanta sutra is tied specifically with each upanishad and every sutra of the vedanta sutra is connected to a vishaya vakya which means a a um, a a, uh, a statement vakya from the upanishads that is the sutra's vishaya or its subject matter uh, that that sutra is discussing so for example the the sutra janmadya seyata that all of us are familiar with um that the lord is the 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 origin the beginning the the maintenance and the end of this creation the dissolution janmadya siyataha is the vishaya vakya for this is that statement in the upanishads yato vaimani bhutani jayante yena jatani jivanti tad prayant yabhisham vishanti tad vijignyasasva tad brahma uh, essentially that uh, the lord is brahman is yato vaimani bhutani jayante is that that uh, existence that entity from which everything is born yena jatani and after birth it jivanti it's uh, it is in him that everything rests or exists tad prayanti abhisham vishanti and at the end 
uh, everything enters back into him. So that statement from the Upanishads is the Vishaya Vakya, the subject, uh, which that sutra, Janmadya Sayyataha, is uh, explaining or commenting upon. <clears throat> so when Prakashananda Saraswati um, uh, uh, speaks to Mahaprabhu about not studying Vedanta. He is referring, of course, to Vedanta Sutra, but even more importantly, to the Upanishads, which are the subject matter uh, of the Vedanta Sutra. Indeed, in the last 1,500 years, every theistic school in India, every Astika school in India, particularly every branch of Vedanta, has um, established its viewpoint using uh, a commentary uh, explanation of the Upanishads and the Vedanta Sutra. They have been the most important foundation for the establishment of different schools of uh, Vedanta. Um, and so the question really is what makes the Upanishads so special? And, and that's what I hope to highlight in today's session is Really, how can we appreciate as Vaishnavas, um, even though the Upanishads are not uh, our, our primary uh, subject matter for study, but we do, of course, study the Upanishads, like the Isha Upanishad, but uh, we focus on other scriptures, such as Srimad Bhagavatam. But why is it the case uh, that uh, we should appreciate the Upanishads? How can we appreciate the Upanishads? In what way? Um, and and, uh, and um, uh, how can we, we appreciate their glories? Uh, what makes them so special that every uh, Vedanta Acharya from uh, the um, uh, non-dualist schools such as Shankaracharya to the Vaishnava schools such as Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya and Shri Jiva Goswami all have spent significant amounts of effort and time in terms of discussing the Upanishads and their role. So um, that's my hope, that's my purpose for today's session. Uh, and um, and we, we will end this session but with a discussion of Srila Jiva Goswami and the ways in which he makes use of the Upanishads in his Sandarbhas. Uh, but Jiva Goswami's uh, use of the Sandarbhas, uh, use of the Upanishads is based upon the use of other Vaishnava Acharyas that come before him. And so it's important to appreciate the full understanding of the Upanishads uh, from the beginning of Vedanta philosophy to our own Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Indeed, even in Bhagavad Gita, um, Krishna highlights why the Upanishads are so special and the Vedanta Sutra. Um, you can see this contrast very clearly, uh, where he is um, criticizing the Vedas, Trigunyo Vishaya Veda, uh, that they are primarily concerned with the three gunas, uh, namely with material subject matters. And he asks Arjuna to be Nistraigunyo, to uh, rise above uh, the three gunas, and therefore it follows to rise above the Vedas. Uh, and he criticizes certain followers of the Vedas. As, uh, of the Vedic Samhitas as being Vedavada Rata, being completely absorbed in uh, um, the flowery language and the karmakanda fruits of the Vedas. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Krishna has only positive things to say about Vedanta, uh, Upanishads and Vedanta Sutra, um, where he refers to them as Pramana, he's Brahma Sutra Padani. Uh, he refers to them as a reference for his own teaching to Arjun. So what this highlights is that the Upanishads, uh, there are key differences between the Upanishads and um, the, um, uh, the, the Vedas. And, and, and those differences, I think, are worth noting for us to um, um, uh, uh, offer some appreciation to understand the glories of the Upanishads so that we can appreciate them and understand them a little bit better. So here I want to show to you um, a simple table uh, that highlights these key areas of difference. Uh, and we'll go very briefly through each one so that you get a general picture, an overall picture, before we get into the details, 
an overall picture of why it is that every Vedanta Acharya has said that the Upanishads supersede the Vedas, uh, that the Vedas are focused upon Karmakanda, the Upanishads on, on, on the cultivation of knowledge, and it is through that knowledge that we can achieve liberation and um, also bhakti. So it's the foundation of transcendental knowledge. So here, um, if you can see my screen here, it's a very simple table, uh, but um, I think it highlights the key points uh, that um, we find. So let's look at the first one here. Uh, the Vedic tradition is primarily focused on, I'm going to actually move from uh, talk about the Vedas and then move to the left for the Upanishads. But the Vedic tradition is focused on Ritha. Uh, Ritha is a concept uh, which is similar to Dharma. It means that which is right, the natural order of this creation. So when the Vedic Brahmana is doing his yajnas, then he is um, specifically uh, attempting to maintain the natural order of this creation. Uh, from the order of the of the natural seasons and the rising of, and setting of the sun and the moon every day to the natural order of of human beings also, uh, and for this reason, uh, it is very important to perform ritual action. That is uh, uh, this um, practice of karmakanda, the appropriate rituals at the right time in the right way. This is crucial. Whereas the Upanishads, they don't reject the viewpoint of the Vedas. Uh, they, they are not against the Vedas at all. They're part of the Vedas. Rather, what they are doing is they're providing something that supersedes, uh, that provides greater depth to Vedic knowledge. And for them, uh, liberation is the primary goal, not the uh, proper uh, order of behavior in this creation, but rather the attempt to achieve liberation from outside. Uh, to, lead, to, to, to achieve freedom from this world. And therefore, instead of ritual action, the primary means of doing that is the cultivation of knowledge. And therefore, from Shankaracharya to Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya, all the Vedantacharyas have emphasized this point that knowledge is going to be the foundation of um, uh, the practice of liberation. Um, because the Vedas are focused on ritual action, that ritual action uh, must be performed by householders. So Vedic ceremonies are very difficult, if not impossible, to be performed by those who are renunciates, um, because one must perform them within the context of uh, householder life. And the role of the Brahmana's wife, the priest's wife, and the Yajmana's wife is essential in the practice of Vedic ceremonies. Uh, even if it is um, uh, uh, marginal, it is essential. Uh, and this is why we find in the Ramayana, for example, uh, Lord Ramachandra uh, uh, creates a golden statue of Mother Sita in order to fulfill this obligation uh, when Sita Devi isn't by his side. Whereas the Upanishads uh, introduce the importance of the concept of renunciation. Uh, and we see this very clearly in the story of Yajna Valkya Muni in uh, the Upanishads. Um, uh, he, uh, how he begins as a householder debating in the court of King Janaka, and he is um, uh, also uh, uh, um, teaching. He's, he's one of the uh, teachers of Janaka as well. Uh, and yet, uh, by uh, the later portions of the Brahad Aranika and Chandogya Upanishad, we find that Yajna Valkimuni is leaving home to become a renunciate, to take sannyas. And when he does this, um, then we find him in the, the Chandogya Upanishad. Uh, he is um, uh, uh, dividing his property, his material goods, and his inheritance, his spiritual goods also, between his two wives. Um, uh, that uh, uh, one is Maitreyi, who is a Brahmavadini. Maitreyi is interested in his spiritual knowledge and Katyayani, who's interested in his material possessions. Uh, so we see this importance of renunciation emerge in the Upanishads. And then uh, we have um, uh, the Vedas focus on living a happy and good life in this world, in this lifetime. 
So the Karmakanda uh, 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 practice of the Vedas is meant to create happiness and prosperity in our world uh, today uh, by, um, by uh, uh, giving a progeny, for example, to, to, to populate the world to, uh, for destruction of one's enemies, for the collection of wealth. Uh, the yajamana can, um, can, uh, 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 can perform the uh, uh, um, Vedic sacrifice for all variety of different purposes uh, that help us become happy in this world, in this life. Whereas uh, for uh, the Upanishads, the happy life in this world is not um, the uh, most important focus. Rather, instead of living comfortably in this life, the Upanishads focus upon the... Um, even it is, it is better to perform ascetic practice or to perform austerity in this life to achieve liberation in the next, right? So instead of the focus on the comfortable life now, the Upanishads say better we perform austerity now. Then the Vedas focus on the performance of sacrifice, uh, yajna, uh, which also involved animal sacrifices. Uh, whereas the Upanishads said, um, how is it possible that the um, performance of animal sacrifices, that sh giving of pain to another uh, uh, human being, uh, another uh, living being rather, is going to give you anything worthwhile for ultimate liberation. Rather, we should practice ahimsa or nonviolence. And finally, the Vedas focus extremely on uh, parentage, uh, especially on uh, one's um, uh, uh, birth, uh, that to perform and to learn and to perform Vedic rituals, one must be born in a proper Brahminical family, uh, or at least um, in a, in a high-class high family. Uh, and uh, this allows one access to learn and teach the Vedas. Whereas the Upanishads demonstrate a commitment to achievement uh, or merit. Uh, and the best example of this is uh, Satyakama, uh, who he, um, when we, this is a story that you may be familiar with, but when he comes to uh, his, um, uh, he, he, he comes to a teacher and says his guru, and he says, I want to learn the Vedas. Please give me Vedic knowledge. Uh, make me your student. Initiate me as your disciple. And the first question that the teacher asks Satyakama is, um, who is your father? And of course, by asking uh, who is your father, he is asking what is his lineage? What is his parentage? What is his varna? Uh, and Satyakama says, he's just a little boy, and he says, I don't know, let me go ask my mother. And uh, he goes to his mother, his, her name is Jabala, and uh, she says, uh, my son, I knew many men before you were born, and therefore I do not know who your father is. Uh, I gave you the name Satyakama, and my name is Jabala. Therefore, you are called Satyakama Jabala. This is all I know. And Satyakama he goes and he tells his guru these, this very fact. Uh, and uh, his, um, uh, this is, of course, a very embarrassing thing uh, for anyone living at that time. Uh, and even today, it's a very embarrassing fact that he does not know his father, and therefore th it is clear that it is not possible that he is from a high-class varna. Um, and so, uh, this, but he's, he's completely honest when he goes to his teacher. And uh, his guru says, um, only a Brahmin could be this honest. And he says, because you are so honest, therefore by your qualities, you are qualified to study the Vedas. Go fetch some firewood. And um, getting firewood, when the guru asks the disciple to bring firewood, in the Upanishads, this is a sign that he is initiating him into Vedic knowledge. So, as you can see, there's, there's quite a difference um, in emphasis between the Vedas and the Upanishads, a significant 
difference in emphasis. And um, uh, for this reason, uh, the Upanishads regard themselves as secret knowledge. They are knowledge that is um, not available to the general community. So whereas all Brahmins would study and teach the Vedas, very few understood the, the knowledge of the Upanishads. And we find this again and again um, in various debates in the Upanishads, various philosophical discussions. Always this point is being made that the knowledge of the Upanishads is something that is unique, it's special, it's secret, it's set apart from the knowledge of the Vedas. Yagnya Valkya Muni makes this point in the debate he has in the court of King Janaka with all the other philosophers. The debate is essentially to see who understands the secret knowledge of the self that is found in the Upanishads, the knowledge of the soul. Whereas the Vedas are common knowledge for everyone who is trained in Brahminical culture. So hopefully this gives you an overview of what makes the Upanishads special, what makes them unique, and why is it that from Lord Krishna himself all the way through all the Acharyas uh, in the Vedantic tradition all have set apart and elevated the Upanishads as being essential to uh, understand spiritual knowledge. Okay, so uh, we have here, after this overview, um, a, um, a, 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 a good sense of the overall picture of the Upanishads and their content and what makes them special. But there's another point that I want to highlight, uh, which is that the Upanishads are unique not only in their content, uh, which is what I've been discussing so far. They are unique not only in the content of their knowledge, but also in their manner of teaching, in, in how they convey that knowledge. Uh, you see, the Upanishads, <clears throat> they are teaching primarily um, <clears throat> as a, um, in the form of dialogues, uh, in the form of conversations. Um, this is something quite special because we don't find uh, dialogue, discussion, question and answers as a common form of teaching before uh, the Upanishads. Uh, this is <clears throat> very uh, special. And uh, Sri Pai Shankaracharya, in his commentaries on uh, the Upanishads, uh, when there are, when there are, uh, um, uh, the, 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 di the dialogue aspect of the Upanishads is so important that when teaching is provided not in the form of dialogue, then he makes note and explains why that is the case. In fact, not only are the Upanishads teaching in the form of dialogue, but they, those dialogues are always student-driven. Uh, that is, that it's always the student who is prompting the dialogue. Uh, it, is, it is very rare. It happens, but it is rare for the teacher to say, um, I know you don't want to learn this, but you must, and let me teach you now. Almost always, what happens is that the student says, uh, uh, Sir, teach me more. I want to learn more about this. Or, uh, please explain this point to me. And then the teacher responds. We are very used to this form of dialogue um, as a method of teaching from Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the most common form of teaching that happens in Srimad Bhagavatam or in other Puranas. But I think it's important to highlight that when it comes to Vedic literature, the Upanishads are really the first place that we find this sort of teaching in terms of dialogue um, happening. Uh, that it's very rare to find this in the Vedic Samhitas. Uh, and, um, and, and particularly the fact that they represent an ex excellent form of teaching, uh, that um, uh, the student-driven teaching is a special contribution of the Upanishads. Uh, and when a, a, a student is not driving the conversation, a teacher is, Shankaracharya tries to explain why is it that in this case 
in this unusual situation, the teacher is actually uh, initiating the dialogue rather than the student. So not only is the content of the Upanishads special, but their method of teaching as well. And to demonstrate this, I want to um, read together with you uh, a section of the Upanishads, which is mm, probably the most famous portion of uh, the Upanishads. Uh, and this is in Chandogya Upanishad, chapter 6, uh, which is the story of Shvetaketu and his father, Uddalaka Aruni. Uh, it's, um, it's a wonderful section and one that I want to focus on in depth uh, with us together. Um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to uh, increase our appreciation of the Upanishads. So once again, I'll share my screen and uh, I want to just read with you uh, a, a, this section. And as I'm reading this section, uh, please pay attention to uh, not just what is being said, but how it is being said, how the teacher is teaching the student. What is the method that he is using, that Udalika is using to convey uh, the fundamental points that he is making? Uh, and afterwards, I will request you to please um, uh, highlight what you have noted. Uh, what are the methods of teaching? Okay, so we will get into the content very soon. But for now, please pay attention to the method of teaching. Make some notes and then I'll request you to... Um, highlight um, some aspects that you notice. So, um, here it is. Uh, this comes uh, from the translation of Patrick Olivelle. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Austin, um, and he has written a very, uh, uh, um, very uh, uh, um, well-researched translation of the Upanishads that is not... Um, uh, leaning towards any one school of Vedanta. The problem is that, that m most translations uh, are, uh, of the Upanishads tend to highlight, tend to use the interpretation of Shankaracharya. This is a fact. Um, if, you, if you pick up any average translation of the principal Upanishads uh, uh, in, in the market, um, almost all of them will be either by a follower of uh, Shankaracharya of Advaita Vedanta, or they will accept his understandings, his explanations, without any uh, critical thought. Uh, and one of the nice things about Patrick Olivelle's translation is that he um, uses a language that is easy to understand, but also that is not um, in any one school of Vedanta. Because if you have a translation that is in the Madhva school of Vedanta, then it's difficult to explain that in terms of Vishishtadvaita, uh, in terms of Ramanujacharya's philosophy, because each of the items will be um, translated already according to um, uh, Madhvacharya. So then it will be difficult to explain it in terms of Ramanujacharya. So this translation provides kind of a neutral starting point, and then I will explain as we analyze this passage, I will explain how different Acharyas understand it. Okay? So um, here, uh, we'll begin uh, over here uh, with uh, where it says one, the beginning of chapter six. Um, there was one Shvetaketu, the son of Aruni. One day his father told him, Shvetaketu, take up the life, the celibate life of a student, a Brahmacharya, and f for there is no one in our family, my son, who has not studied and is the kind of Brahman who is so only because of birth. So remember I said one of the unique aspects of the Upanishads is that they focus on qualification more than birth. And this is a good example of that, where the father is telling the son, uh, there's no one in our family who is a Brahman only by birth, uh, without qualification. So you must go and study from a guru. So he went away to become a student at the age of 12. And learning all the Vedas, returned when he was 24, after 12 years, swell-headed, thinking himself to be learned and arrogant. His father then said to him, 
Shweta Ketu, here you are, my son, th- swell headed, thinking yourself to be learned and arrogant. So you must have surely asked about that rule of substitution by which one hears what has not been heard of before, thinks of what has not been thought of before, and perceives what has not been perceived before. So here he's highlighting how he's asking him, have you learned that secret knowledge which um, one has not heard of before, that most people cannot teach you um, or not? Uh, and in that is the rule of substitution. And, uh, and Shweta Ketu has not learned this. So he spent 12 years in the forest learning the Vedas, but he has not learned the knowledge of the Upanishads. And so, uh, to his credit, he asks his father, how indeed does that rule of substitution work? Uh, and then his father answers, Uh, It is like this, son. By means of just one lump of clay, one would perceive everything made of clay. The transformation is a verbal handle, a name, while reality is just this. It is clay. So then he goes on to explain. And uh, there's very nice dialogue here, but uh, I'll skip ahead to this um, section. Uh, This is the most famous section in Chapter 6. Uh, which uh, we are all familiar with, even if we haven't read it recently, uh, where uh, every passage uh, ends with this famous statement, tat tuam asi, you are that, right? Or um, in the way Patrick Oliver translates it, that's how you are, Shweta Ketu. So I'm going to begin here, we're number 10, and uh, read... Uh, a couple of these paragraphs, and each one is a little story. So this is still Uddalaka t- uh, teaching his son, Shweta Ketu. Now, take these rivers, son. The easterly ones flow towards the east, and the westerly ones flow towards the west. From the ocean, they merge into the very ocean. They become just the ocean. In that state, they are not aware that I am that river and I am this river. In exactly the same way, son, when all these creatures reach the existent, by existent, he's translating sat, reach sat, they are not aware that we are reaching the existent. No matter what they are in this world, whether it is a tiger, a lion, a wolf, a boar, a worm, a moth, a gnat, or a mosquito, They all merge into that. The finest essence here, that constitutes the self of this whole world. That is the truth. That is the self, Atma. And that's how you are, Shweta Ketu. Sir, teach me more. Very well, son. Now, take this huge tree here, son. If someone were to hack it at the bottom, its living sap would flow. Likewise, if someone were to hack it in the middle, its living sap would flow. And if someone were to hack it at the top, its living sap would flow. Pervaded by the living essence, Jivatma, this tree stands here, ceaselessly drinking water and flourishing. When, however, life or Jiva leaves one of its branches, that branch withers away. When it leaves a second branch, that likewise withers away. And when it leaves a third branch, that also withers away. When it leaves the entire tree, the whole tree withers away. In exactly the same way, he continued, know that this, of course, dies when it is bereft of life. By this, he's pointing to his body. Uh, Know that this, of course, dies when it is bereft of life, but life itself does not die. The finest essence here, that constitutes the self of this whole world. That is the truth, that is the self, Atma, and that's how you are, Tattvam Asi, Shweta Ketu. Sir, teach me more. Very well, son. Now, uh, for this next passage, uh, this next two, 
I need a volunteer, someone who can be Shweta Ketu, uh, who can read. Um, uh, uh, I, I'll read the line for Odalika and then Shweta Ketu. The dialogue will be better in this way rather than me reading all of it. Uh, can someone please volunteer? Please unmute for yourself and volunteer. Thank you, Swain Jyoti Prabhu. Thank you so much. So, just to clarify, when you say bring a banyan fruit, that's your part because yes. you are the father. Yes. Correct, and I am the other one. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh. Yes. And we'll do two, number twelve and thirteen. Okay. Bring a banyan fruit. Here it is, sir. Add it up. I've cut it up, sir. What do you see there? These quite tiny seeds, sir. Now take one of them and cut it up. I've cut one up, sir. What do you see there? Nothing, sir. This finest essence here, son, that you cannot even see. Look how on account of that finest essence, this huge banyan tree stands here. Believe, my son, the finest essence here, and he's pointing to himself, that constitutes the self of this whole world. That is the truth. That is the self, Atma. And that's how you are, Shweta Ketu. Sir, teach me more, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> teach me Very more. well, son. Uh, put this chunk of salt in a container of water and come back tomorrow. So at this point, uh, Shweta Ketu uh, takes some salt, puts it in a glass of water, and then the next day, the father says, the chunk of salt you put in the water last evening, bring it here. And the son uh, gropes for the water, uh, for the salt. He looks for the salt in the water, but he cannot find it because it's dissolved completely. Now, take a sip of the water from this corner. How does it taste? Sorry, I, I can't see the top of the answer. Here. About 14 is the answer, probably. But on the yes. screen, I cannot see. Oh, you cannot see it? Okay. Um, it's okay. I'll read. No problem. Uh, yeah. How does it taste? Uh, okay. Salty. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Salty. Okay. It is there now. Salty. Yeah. Let me can yeah. see. Okay. Okay. It took some time to up update. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, take a sip from the center. How does it taste? Salty. Take a sip from that corner. How does it taste? Salty. Throw it out and come back later. And so the, uh, the Shweta Ketu throws out the water as in he pours it out or maybe on some rock or something like that. And over time, the water uh, evaporates, it dries. And when he comes back, uh, he sees that the salt was always there. When the water evaporates, then the salt is left. Uh, on the on the rock uh, or in the container. The father told him, you of course did not see it there, son. Yet the salt was always right there. The finest essence here, that constitutes the self of this whole world. That is the truth. That is the self, Atma. And that's how you are, Shweta Ketu. Sir, teach me more. Very well, son. So we'll stop there. Uh, I want to ask you, what is it that you notice about how Udalika is teaching Shweta Ketu? Thank you, Swami Jyoti Krishna Prabhu, for the, our, your help <laughs> today. Um, so what, what is it that, what do you notice uh, that is in the manner of teaching? Please, uh, not about what he is saying. We'll discuss that uh, a little bit later. But how is he teaching it? Uh, can anyone give some uh, suggestions? What is uh, distinctive about his teaching method? Uh, 
Anything, even the most obvious points, please note them. Yes, Prabhu. Swam Jyoti Prabhu. Uh, yeah, uh, you're quite right. The, the son is asking all the questions, basically. You know, he's very interested, inquisitive, rather. He's very inquisitive. So he wants to ask why, 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 what do you do, why? You know? Yes. So I think, so it is, as you said, it's student-led. Yes, very nice. Student-driven, right? Uh, Student-led. Um, as you said, he, the, it's all, the, the, the teacher is only continuing because the student keeps saying, Sir, teach me more, and is responding enthusiastically. Excellent. Rukmini Krishna Prabhu, what else? Yeah, thank you, Prabhu. I observed that it's through experience. He's making him learn through experience. Bring the seeds, cut it, you know, you know take the salt, put it in water. So everywhere is learning by experience. Shatter. Yes. Very nice point, Prabhu. Excellent point. So. The, it's experiential learning. Um, he's teaching by experience. He's pointing to things. He says, bring me a banyan seed. Now cut it up. Now look inside. He's saying, put the salt in the water. Now pour it out. Now taste it. He's using all of his senses, sight and taste and, and hearing, everything he's using and giving him an experience of what it is that he wants to teach. Just from a teaching, from a pedagogical perspective, teaching is far more effective when it involves interaction and when it involves all the senses. In the manner of Vedic teaching, the student is asked to sit before the teacher and recite and repeat, right? That's the mode of teaching. But the Upanishads do something very special, which is they, they elaborate, they use teaching techniques that are very experiential and very practical. Thank you. Excellent point. Uh, Bhakti Prabhav Maharaj. Yes, I have the same point that uh, the teacher is stimulating the thoughts of the, of the student and helps the, the student to come to his own conclusion. And when he comes to his own conclusion, then he gets it. He has done it. That, and that's very special, I think. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you, Maj. It's, it's, um, the, te the, the teacher is encouraging the student to come to his own conclusions. Um, it's uh, through experimentation, right? So not only is it experiential, but it is experimental also. There's this wonderful section in Brahad Aranyak Upanishad. I like it very much, where the teacher is telling uh, the student, Annam Brahma, right? So this is a famous uh, passage. Uh, not in the same place, a different place, but it says, Annam Brahme Tivyajana, Anna Deva Kalvimani Bhutani, Jayante Yena Jatani Jivanti, Tad Prayant Yabijam Vishanti, Tad Vijignyasasva, Tad Brahmeti. Saying essentially that Brahman is Annam or food, uh, the very substance of this world. And he's teaching him this point uh, that we can see uh, Brahman even in that which sustains us, because all beings are born from food, uh, they're born because of food, Anna. They are uh, existing because of Anna, and then they return back into, th this is, in the end, they become food again for other living beings. So he's saying Annam Brahma, that uh, Anna is, is, uh, is uh, Brahm, uh, Brahman, is, is the absolute truth. We can see it in this way. And in order to prove this point to the, teach to the student, uh, the teacher says, I want you to fast uh, uh, for two days or something like that. He said, do, uh, fast and then come back to me tomorrow to learn more about this fact. And the teacher, the student is very uh, dutiful and he fasts and he comes back to the teacher and the teacher says, okay, now recite the Vedic mantras that you have memorized <laughs> and the student cannot remember. <laughs> and he's too hungry. He's too weak. He's been fasting for two or three days. And so the teacher says, see, the mind is made of food. Uh, that this manas and the buddhi is made of anna also. Therefore, annam brahma. So this, in this way, the Upanishads have wonderful experimental modes of teaching where they are asking the students to try something, to experience it, and to come to their own conclusion about it. What else? What else do you notice? What kinds of experiments is, this, is the teacher asking the student to do in this section from Chandogya that we just read? Uh, give me some more thoughts here. 
about what's happening and how is the teacher speaking. Other qualities of the mode of teaching. Anyone? There's plenty more. Yes, Pranagov in the proof. I was just curious, guessing, I don't know. Yes, please. 424, Brahma Arpanam Brahma Havi, Brahma Hotam Brahma Agno, Brahma Naiva Tena Gantibam Brahma Karma Samadhina. So, Brahman, that's salt, going to the water, uh, it's also Brahman, and then uh, whatever the taste came out of that, it's also Brahman. So, it's a one substance actually all. Uh, yes. if, if that can be uh, at the end uh, conclusion. Yes. Uh, th yes, yes, Prabhu, that is, that is the conclusion, but it's half the conclusion. So, we'll speak mm -hmm. about the other half in just a moment. I'm going to address the content of this passage very soon. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, please don't let me forget. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, but but l let me just highlight two more things about the method of teaching. Uh, notice that the teaching is highly repetitive. At the end of every story, every parable that he's giving, he's repeating the same phrase. The finest essence here, that constitutes the self or soul of this whole world. That is the truth. That is the self, Atma. And that's what you are, Shweta Ketu. This he repeats every single time. Uh, repetitiveness is a very powerful teaching tool in the Upanishads. You will see it any Upanishad section that you, you, you read, you'll find the teacher repeating the same phrases for several reasons. One is the Upanishads are oral texts, they're oral teaching. Uh, they are meant to be spoken by the Guru to the disciple, not read like we are reading today. Um, and, and therefore, if, you, if you're listening and you want to get that point, the teacher should repeat. Secondly, because it's oral, they are taught through memorization. And when you have a repetition and a certain chorus, a refrain, just like in a song, there's a refrain that we sing over and over again. Um, like in the song, Nadia Godrume Nityananda Mahajan, that, one, we, that line we repeat over and over again. That's a refrain. So the Upanishads will also have a refrain, a, a rep repetitive point that they are making every time. And that helps with memorization. The student can easily memorize because the structure is the same each time for the teaching. Mm -hmm. So it helps with memorization. It helps with, um, with uh, um, uh, uh, teaching orally, but also it helps with meditation. The Upanishads are meant to be meditated upon. Each phrase and idea, one must think through and contemplate and meditate upon. And meditation takes place when there is repetition. Right? We know this from our practice in Japa. So uh, you'll find that the teaching of the Upanishads is very repetitive in its structure and its content, in its words. The teachers are using the same words over and over again. Um, so uh, it is experiential, it's experimental, it's student-driven, it's repetitive. And fourthly, I want to point out how it's connected to the natural world. He's asking him to experience things in the natural world, uh, in, in what we see around us. Trees, seeds, rivers, bees, plants. Um, water, all of these things are the subject matter of the Upanishads teaching. We will find over and over again, the Upanishads teach by pointing to the world around us, to the natural world, rather than to the human created world. So these are some elements of good teaching in the Upanishads, the Upanishads pedagogy. And I think they're very interesting and very useful, even for us as teachers, um, the, the methods that the Upanishads use. The Upanishads represent a watershed moment in the history of Indian philosophy. Just like in Western philosophy, uh, Socrates is a, 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 um, a, a, a unique moment in Western philosophy. 
which changes the history of Western philosophy. Uh, and why? Because Socrates teaches using dialogues. He does the same thing. He doesn't have a conclusion immediately. He asks the student to reach that conclusion. He's repetitive in his practice. He's engaging. He's asking the, the, the student to experience the natural world. Um, so also in the Upanishads, we find this is a very special thing in the teaching of the Upanishads. That then um, all the other teachers that come after, that, that, that teach the Upanishads, they use these same techniques of dialogue and debate. In the Upanishads, we find three types of dialogues. One is a dialogue between teacher and student, uh, just like we read here, Chandogya chapter 6, where a guru is teaching a disciple who is eager to learn. The second type of dialogue that we find in the Upanishads is debate. When there is an argument happening between different philosophers, the most famous example of this debate is in um, the... Uh, 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 Brahad Arani Kopanishad in the court of King Janaka, when Yagnya Valkyamuni is asked, uh, when, when Janaka creates a challenge, he says, whoever is the most intelligent Brahman here can take these thousand cows. And all the Brahmins there are very humble uh, and meek, and no one comes forward uh, to take the thousand cows. But then Yagnya Valkyamuni, he tells his student, he says, drive these cows away. Uh, they are ours. They belong to me. And this move from Yagnya Valkya Muni gets everyone really upset. Immediately, the whole uh, uh, group of Brahmins and Rishis and sages, they jump and they say, what is it? How, how do you think that you are so intelligent uh, that uh, you, you have the most knowledge amongst us? Prove it. And of course, this is uh, uh, Janaka, King Janaka's, uh, Janaka's Rajarshi, this is his uh, goal, uh, his, his purpose was to spark debate, right? This is what Maharaj Janaka enjoys, is listening to debate so that he gets even deeper knowledge. Uh, so he, he, this is why he invited all the Brahmanas from the Kuru Panjala region and from the Maithili region and from all the different regions of India, he invited these, these rishis to come, was for the purpose of debate. But Yagnya Valkya Muni is, is a very, he's a very sprightly, very courageous character in, in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the Upanishads. And he comes forth and he says, drive these cows away, which sparks the debate amongst all of them. In fact, we find Yagnya Valkya Muni maintains this spirit of his rather uh, forthcoming and aggressive spirit. We find even in, um, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, you may recall in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Yagnya Valkya Muni is, is uh, he's, he's, uh, uh, he, he goes to his teacher his, and he says, all these other students of mine, uh, my co-students, uh, they're not very intelligent. <clears throat> uh, Gurudev, don't waste your time teaching them. Instead, you should teach me only. And his guru becomes really upset at this and kicks him out of the school. And so Yagnya Valkya Muni then says, okay, if he won't teach me, I'm going to find mantras that Vedic mantras that even uh, my guru, no one else has learned so far. And then he uh, worships uh, Surya Narayan, Lord Surya, who gives him Vedic mantras that no one else knows before Yagnya Valkya Muni. So he's a very, very powerful Muni and sage, very amazing character and very aggressive in his approach. Uh, and we find this in the most famous debate in the Upanishads. Uh, which includes Yagnya Valkya Muni and Uddalaka Aruni, the same sage that we read about uh, here uh, in, the, in the story of Sheta Ketu. And also Gargi is there. Uh, she is debating also. And um, uh, um, in the end, Yagnya Valkya Muni emerges victorious. And Gargi uh, emer emerges victorious with him. She becomes the judge of the whole, um, uh, what's the word, of the whole debate. She's the one who decides who is the winner um, in the debate. So in this way, uh, this is the second type of dialogue. So the first kind was teacher to student. The second type is debate between uh, equals. And the third is a friendly discussion between equals. And this can, this can be wide ranging. It can be discussions about um, uh, uh, renunciation, uh, about sannyas. It can be discussions about family. It can be discussions about many different uh, subjects.
प्राण गोविंद प्रभु प्रभु व्हाट्स द डिफरेंस बिटवीन योर दिस थ्री डिवीजन वर्सेस बादर जल्प एंड वितंद इज इट द सेम और यू आर जस्ट no no so so the, this is a different kind of division um the 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 uh the, those are are the 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 vada and jalpa and vitanda these are different modes of dialogue that can exist even inside each type so the types that i'm describing are are more in terms of the uh story the structure of the dialogue whereas that is about the quality of the dialogue is there a name or and of these three Yes. No, no, no. This is this is just from uh, from study of the different kinds that okay. you find there. So one very nice scholar of the Upanishads has uh, divided based on studying the different stories that are found the the, the uh, activities. Yeah. Uh, Vishwavasu Prabhu. You're. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Prabhu. Yes. Uh, Uh, Prabhu, uh, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Shri Prabhupada wrote in debate between Guru and uh, uh, disciple, Guru will win. And what what is the kind of debate between Guru and disciple? How is it possible? I don't ah. understand. No, no, no. Uh, so in the Parishads, you do not find any debates between Guru and disciple. that was the first kind that i mentioned the second kind is debate amongst equals not among guru and disciple um now having said that the disciple in the upanishads will often ask very challenging questions uh the, the disciples in the upanishads uh, never accept anything just uh like that without um interrogating without asking deep questions of the guru uh we find this many times and the guru will challenge the disciple and the disciple will challenge the guru but there's never a debate uh, debates occur not between gurus and disciples debates only occur between equals uh, 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 other sages who are um, equals thank you for asking that clarification okay so uh we have now um the content that i want to mention uh, to discuss and um the content that i want to focus on uh, in the very limited time that we have this is a topic that can go on for many days in fact i i teach a course uh, on the upanishads uh, half the course is on the upanishads and we discuss this for several weeks uh, just this passage from chandogya chapter 6 because it is extremely foundational for um uh for all vedanta acharyas the the vishaya vakya uh for the fifth sutra vedanta sutra um uh ikshater na shabdam that sutra is found in this passage that vishaya vakya is found in this section uh, chandogya chapter 6 so very important but of course the most important part of this uh um uh section is uh the phrase tat tvam asi which is found repeatedly after every story that udalaka rishi tells um shwetaketu he ends it by saying and that is what you are tat tvam asi you are that shwetaketu and this section every one of our acharyas um in the history of vedanta has uh, um explains this section and through that explanation provides the foundation of their uh entire philosophy through it so um i'm going to just go through very very briefly uh, uh because like i said this there's there's so much that can be said about tatvam asi and uh, we could discuss uh, one to two hours on each one of the acharyas shankaracharya ramanuj acharya madhvacharya and shila jiva goswami uh, but i'm going to give you a very quick overview and then leave some time for questions so um the big question tat tvam asi tat meaning that tat tvam meaning you and asi means are you are that simple or that you are that thou art 
Um, so the big question <laughs> is, what is that? What is that referring to, tat? Uh, namely, what is Brahman? What is Tvam? Who are you? Uh, and, and each one of the Vedanta Acharyas disagrees. They have their own perspective on what is Tat? What is Tvam? But the most difficult question is actually Asi, which is what does is mean? What does it mean to be? You are that. What does it mean to be something? Uh, and that's where the most intense debates take place. Tat Tvam Asi. Now, when you say you are that, the question of what it means to be something is not easy uh, to answer. It takes actually a lot of thinking to do. So suppose I say a simple statement. Um, this is John. Okay. What does that mean? This is John. If, I, if my name is John and I look in the mirror, I say, oh, this is John, then, then I'm identifying a reflection with John. If I see a group of people and I point to one and I say, this is John, then I'm identifying John as a member of a set through a process of elimination. This is not, this is not, this is not, this is John. If I say John is a painter, then I'm identifying a specific quality as belonging to John. In other words, the verb is, or in Sanskrit, asi, can be used to identify a member of a set. It can be used to identify a quality. It can be used to identify something with its product or reflection or shadow. It can be used to create a pure identity. Just as if I say, water is H2O, right? This is a referential statement of pure identity. Water equals H2O. When I say, John is a painter, I'm not, it's not a pure identity. I'm not saying all painters are John or John is painting, no. It's a qualitative identity. So you can have a pure identity, you can have a qualitative identity, you can have an identity based on uh, a member of a particular set. The word asi or is, the verb is or to be, is actually a very complicated verb. It's one of the most difficult verbs we have. And this is the point of greatest disagreement between the different Acharyas who explain this section of Chandogya Upanishad is what does it mean to identify one thing with another? What is the Upanishad trying to say? When we say tattvam asi, is it saying that you are a member of a set which includes all living beings and that is Brahman? Or are you saying that you are a quality of Brahman or an attribute of Brahman? Or is it saying that you are Brahman in the way that water is H2O, a pure identity? There's many different possibilities. Now, of course, Shankaracharya, he says, um, he creates a pure referential identity here. He says, you are that means an equality, like water is H2O. There's no difference between one and the other. And uh, he does this because he, uh, he values Brahman's unity more than anything else. Brahman is what? One, sat ekam. Uh, and he takes that to mean, uh, it's earlier in the same passage that we didn't read. Uh, it says, sadeva somya idam agraasit. Uddalaka Aruni says, there's only one sat. There's only one thing in this creation that is sat, and sat is Brahman. And he says, Shankaracharya says, okay, if there's one thing, then that means that there cannot be a second, which means that Brahman cannot be in a subject-object relationship with anything else. So in other words, <clears throat> I cannot say that Brahman is beautiful because that puts Brahman in a subject-object relationship. Uh, because beautiful is an attribute, it's an object that is attributed to the subject, which is Brahman, subject and predicate. 
And therefore, he says, now you have two things. And according to the Upanishads, there are no two things. There's only one thing. Therefore, there cannot be a second item. And therefore, when the Upanishads say, you are that, they are referring to a pure identity, that we are Brahman. And this is why, according to Shankaracharya, Brahman has no um, attributes um, whatsoever, because any attribute or quality will put Brahman in relationship to something else. And if he is in relationship to something else, now he is relative rather than being absolute, being unitary, being one. And so uh, um, for this reason, uh, Shankaracharya actually re rejects the idea that Brahman can even be Satchidananda, eternity, knowledge, and bliss. He says we cannot say that Brahman is, sorry, I misspoke. He doesn't re reject that Brahman is Satchidananda. He says he rejects the idea that Brahman is eternal, full of knowledge, and blissful. Because when you say that he is blissful, then you are attributing a quality to Brahman, which creates a duality. You have now two things. Therefore, Shankaracharya says that Brahman is not blissful. He is bliss. He is knowledge. He is eternity. But even that creates a subject-object relationship. Even if you say Brahman is bliss, uh, he is ananda. That creates subject-object. And therefore, he says, in reality, the scriptures, when they say Brahman is bliss, what they are actually saying is that Brahman is not misery, that you cannot attribute anything to Brahman. All you can do is deny the presence of attributes. This is neti neti. Brahman is not bliss, uh, not misery. He is not ignorance. He is not temporariness. That is what the Bra Upan uh, Upanishads are actually saying when they're saying Brahman is Satchidananda. In fact, Shankaracharya goes so far to say that language itself has subject-object relationships. Language requires us to attribute something, some quality to uh, an object. This is the nature of language. It's the structure. Even if you say Brahman is not miserable, you're still attributing a quality to Brahman, yes? Therefore, Shankaracharya says, language itself is useless to understand Brahman. Language is useful initially to help us understand. It, it helps you point, just like a child. He says, just like you point to the moon. You cannot point to the moon. You cannot touch the moon. You just point. So the Upanishads are only pointing to Brahman. They're not describing Brahman. Ultimately, knowledge of Brahman is a precognitive state. It is... Uh, beyond language. It comes before language. Knowledge of Brahman, the closest thing we have to unattributed knowledge in this world, an unattributed experience, is the state of deep sleep, sushupti. And therefore he says that sushupti, or deep sleep, is the closest thing, uh, the closest analogy, he says, to liberation because there can be no subject-object relationship in deep sleep. There's consciousness, but no language, no subject-object relationship. This is, in this way, uh, Shankaracharya interprets the Upanishads and the Vedas completely in an indirect way. No direct statement. Every direct statement about Brahman needs to be made indirect, uh, it, because we cannot attribute any quality to Brahman. Otherwise, we would be compromising his pure unity, his pure one oneness. So tattvam asi for him is merely a state, it's a tautology, it's a, it's, it's a statement of identity that is actually like saying you are you or that is that. It's not adding any new information. It's simply telling us what already exists. It's not attributing anything to Brahman. Now Ramanujacharya he goes so far as, so he says, actually, you are correct. There is no existence without attributes. He says, one cannot, you cannot, you cannot speak without creating subject, object, predicate, right? You have to attribute one thing to another. Not only can you not speak, but you cannot think 
without attributing the quality of one thing to another. And therefore, he says, instead of making Brahman the unattributed reality, since nothing can exist without attributes and nothing can be thought of without attributes, why don't we make Brahman the supreme attributed reality, the one who is fully attributed, which means that he has every quality you can imagine. This makes Brahman one, it makes him supreme, and it, in, it makes him a one without a second. Uh, it makes him absolute, not by removing everything, but by piling everything upon him. So that every quality or attribute now belongs to Brahman, so he becomes a supreme attributed. And so in this understanding, Ramanuja Acharya says, Tat Fam Asi uh, is referring to its, its identifying Tvam or you, the Atma, with Brahman. Uh, it's identifying Atma with Brahman as a quality is identified with the qualified. So for him, Tat Tvam Asi, you are that, is similar to John is a painter. Uh, it's a we are a particular quality or attribute of Brahman. Whereas Shankaracharya takes them as a pure identity. Water is H2O. You are Brahman. Atma is Brahman. Uh, Ramanuja Acharya says, no, this is a, a, a qualified identity. You are Brahman is like John is a painter or you are a painter. It's attributing a specific quality to Brahman. And you, therefore, some problem may occur in a specific quality which does not affect the person to whom it is attributed. So there's a lot more detail here. But Ramanuja Acharya is essentially creating a subject-object uh, relationship that is one of attribute and quality because he sees Brahman as the supreme attributed. Mother Mohan Prabhu. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. As you come up. I'm sorry I came on late because I had a preaching engagement. Thank you so much for this interesting, very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Two questions I have about uh, Shankara's and uh, Ramanuja's epistemology. Number one, it seems to me, please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, Shankara does start with a very literal reading of Tatva Masi. He is literal. And then he has to deliteralize everything else or reinterpret it, the Vedas in a very a uh, roundabout way, just to support his very literal reading of Tatva Masi, whereas Ramanuja reads it in a slightly less literal way and arrives at a more literal reading of the Vedas. Is it correct? Um, so, so uh, Prabhu, I, I, I see exactly what you're saying in terms of Shankaracharya. Uh, so, in terms of Shankaracharya, yes, he's making a 100% literal, uh, direct, translation of Tattva Masi, but for that reason, he has to then interpret all of the Vedas indirectly uh, in order to maintain that pure identity that I mentioned. And this is why, this is one of the points that Mahaprabhu brings up against Shankaracharya's philosophy, is that you are indirectly uh, understanding all of Vyasadeva's work. Um, and, and this is why Shankaracharya calls Tattva Masi a Mahavakya, because it has the capacity to do this. The only thing I will, I will slightly modify what you said is that Ramanuja Acharya's interpretation is not indirect, but is another direct form of understanding the verb asi. So this was my earlier discussion about what we mean by be or is, that verb, uh, us, is, is, has multiple direct meanings. Um, <clears throat> it is not that when we say that uh, Radhika Raman is a professor, this is an indirect use of the word is. That is a direct use of the word is, but it's a different kind of direct usage where I'm attributing mm -hmm. one quality or attribute professor to uh, the word, to the identity of Radhika Raman. So Ramanuja Acharya is not less direct, but he's mm -hmm. using another direct meaning. So just that little modification. Well, yeah, thank you so much. It's very good. And uh, again, looks like the, the, this answer, will, this question will be answered later on your presentation. All the other acharyas will also interp interpret Tattva Masi in a very direct way, but with a different spin on the word I see. So that will be yes. war of direct meanings and which one will yield a better explanation of the Vedas. Yes. 
<laughs> and the yeah. second question, very quick, please yeah, forgive so me for please, taking so much please, time. Please. Um, uh, as far as Shankara's dismissal of all ways uh, to understand Brahman, what does he explain? How does he explain logic and logic's ability to even arrive, arrive at such uh, conclusions as he did? Because ultimately, it looks like logic reigns supreme in all considerations of uh, even uh, all conclusions about uh, Brahman, even the last one, the Sushupti, is the closest to liberation. That's arrived at by logic. Which role does uh, logic play in uh, Shankara's epistemology? Like in our Sampradaya, we have a revelation. Yes. But he's, I think there is no room for revelation. So how does he explain logic and logic's ability to analyze transcendental subjects? Uh, thank you, Prabhu. Uh, excellent question. And actually, uh, for him, Shabda Praman is higher than um, than uh, than um, uh, than than Anumana. Uh, so higher than inferential reasoning. So he does accept Shabda as supreme. Uh, and the way he he uses that is he says, see, the scriptures are pointing to that ultimate reality. So ultimately, logic falls away. Logic turns away from Brahman. Logic, the best it can do is the same as language. It can point to Brahman. It's like the see the moon between the trees logic, right? We, I, the scriptures point to the trees, not because the trees are the object of study, it's because between the trees you can see the moon. And what they're trying to get to the moon, which we cannot reach by logic. So Brahman is super logical. He is sup, uh, he's beyond language also. Um, and so ultimately both logic and language fall away. And even the Vedas fall away, right? Even Shabda Pramana, even scripture falls away uh, because uh, ultimately when we realize Brahman, that's a direct, supralogical, precognitive realization that does not depend on scripture. Scripture helps you get there. Guru helps you get there. But just as you have to leave behind a boat when you cross to the other shore, you have to, so in the same way you leave behind the Vedas and the teacher, when you uh, become uh, realized. Well, he doesn't accept the Vedas as the second form of Brahman as we do. Uh, uh, y- yes. Yeah, sorry. He, he, he does, Prabhu, he does, but, but not as the, as the highest Brahman. It's still in the Vyavaharika level. So it's, it's a very <laughs> complicated approach he takes. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I, I only have just a few minutes left. I want to just say a couple more words and then I, I will formally conclude the session and people who have the time to stay on just for informal discussion are welcome to. But uh, because I want everyone to hear just the last uh, two minutes, uh, I'm going to just go really quickly. So uh, I, I wish I had more time for this, but Madhvacharya, he is very fascinating. For him, uh, uh, there is no uh, difference, there, there is no unity in quality or substance between Brahman and Atman. So um, the, the, um, the followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and also of Ramanujacharya accept that there's qualitative oneness between Brahman and Atman, right? This is why we said for Ramanujacharya, this, the Atma is a quality, an attribute of Brahman, who is a supreme attribute. Uh, so we say something similar, uh, but in different language. We use the language of Shakti uh, instead of um, the language that Ramanujacharya uses. But the idea is very similar. Um, but Madhvacharya, he rejects the, the idea that there is any qualitative or quantitative or substantial unity between Atma and Brahman. Uh, there's only difference. What brings Atman and Brahman together is a relationship of complete dependence. That Brahman is Swatantra and uh, uh, Atma is Paratantra. Because this world and Brahman is fully dependent on Brahman, therefore they are connected. They are tied to each other. But it's not a unity of any kind. There's only difference. And he's very, he, he's very particular about saying that nowhere in the Vedas is unity, oneness ever taught. So both Ramanujacharya and the Gaudiya Vaishnavacharyas, we say that the Vedas teach both oneness and difference. And we find both. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, Shankaracharya says the Vedas only teach oneness. Therefore, any statements of difference are secondary. 
we must explain them uh, according to oneness. The, the uh, uh, Ramanuja Acharya and Srila Jiva Goswami, they say oneness and difference both exist. We must hold them together. So this is why it's called Vishishtadvaita or Bheda Bheda. Madhvacharya, he says, the only thing that exists is difference. Nowhere throughout the Vedas will we find a statement of oneness. And so we might ask, well, how do you explain Tattvamasi, which seems like a simple statement of oneness. Uh, he says, actually it is not Tattvam Asi. Read the whole section. Esha Atma Tattvam Asi. Esha Atma Tattvam Asi. Normally we translate this as He, Esha, this, this, Atma. This is the self, this is the soul. Tattvam Asi. And you are that. This is how everyone translates Madhvacharya says, no, Esha Atma Tattvam Asi, you have to divide the Sandhi, and if you divide the Sandhi properly, it is Esha Atma Atattvam Asi. This is the Atma, and you are not that. That meaning Brahman. So he is Atma, Tat means Brahman. You are not that. This Atma is not Brahman. So actually, this entire passage is consistently saying, over and over again, that and Shweta Ketu, you are the Atma and you are not Brahman. You are the Atma and all of these, the lion, the moth, the mosquito, they are all Atma, but not Brahman. And that is his wonderful explanation uh, that he gives. So in the end, then, to conclude, Srila Jiva Goswami, uh, he, he, he provides a commentary on the first five sutras of Vedanta Sutra, and, as, and through that, then a commentary on the uh, relevant sections of the Upanishads in his Paramatma Sandarbha, at the end of his Paramatma Sandarbha. And his explanation of the Upanishads and Vedanta Sutra uh, almost completely follows that of Sripad Ramanuja Acharya. Uh, in fact, he quotes entire sections of Ramanuja Acharya's commentary verbatim in Paramatma Sandarbha to express his complete agreement with Ramanuja Chayu's perspective on this matter. So just for your uh, enjoyment, I will share one table that I created on, uh, that compares um, the, that shows how Srila Jiva Goswami uses, uh, sorry, how he comments upon the, um, uh, the Upanishads in Paramatma Sandarbha. So Jiva Goswami's unique contribution is that he demonstrates that the meaning of the Vedanta Sutra and therefore the meaning of the Upanishads is found within the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. By demonstrating it in the first verse, his point is to say that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the ideal commentary on Vedanta Sutra, which is a systematic, uh, the Vedanta Sutra is a systematization, is a commentary on the Upanishads. Therefore, the meaning of the Upanishads is found in Srimad Bhagavatam. This is his goal. The understanding of the Upanishads, he's happy to take from Ramanuja Acharya. He doesn't find the need to add too much more to that. But his special contribution is to say, all of what Ramanuja Acharya describes and the Upanishads describe is found in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And to demonstrate that, he demonstrates it, obviously not with the entire Bhagavatam, which would be a huge task, he demonstrates it just with the Prathama Shloka, the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. And here you see, um, on the left side of this table, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, on the left side of the table, you will find uh, the passage from the Upanishads, like Chandogya 816 or Shvetashvatara. Uh, and then the, the word or the phrase within, uh, the, um, uh, within the Bhagavatam, uh, which is explaining within the first verse, which is explaining that passage. So several times in this talk, I quoted this phrase from Taittiriya, Yato Vaimani Bhutani Jayante. Uh, uh, that is explained quite directly by Janmadhyaya Sayyataha and also Trisargo Mrisha. So he takes all these different passages uh, and one can go down and see. Uh, and many, these are all the classic passages from Upanishads that are most important for not just our Acharyas, but going all the way back to 
Shankaracharya, Ramanujachari, all of them. These are the most important passages. And he quotes them and he explains them in terms of the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, making the point that Bhagavatam contains the meaning of the Upanishads and the Vedanta Sutra. So this table is a page in my book uh, called um, the, um, the uh, uh, Chaitanya Vaishnava Vedanta of Srila Jiva Goswami. And um, uh, for anyone who wants a copy of, a book, of this book, a digital copy, you can send me an email and I'll be happy to email you a copy. But in this book, the focus of the discussion is Srila Jiva Goswami's commentary on the first five sutras of Vedanta Sutra, going from uh, Atato Brahma Jignasa to Ikshater Nashabdam. And uh, through that, of course, then he's also explaining the Upanishads. But doing all of that commentary on Upanishads, on uh, uh, Vedanta Sutra through Srimad Bhagavatam. So uh, this is just to conclude and show us how the Upanishads become important even within our own Gaudiya Vaishnav tradition. There is so much more that can be said, um, especially on that passage in Chandogya chapter 6. I wanted to say a lot more on Chandogya chapter 6, uh, that section. I only covered about half of what I wanted to say. But our time is up and I want to be respectful of the fact that all of you have so many sevas to do, especially on a Sunday. So um, thank you uh, so much for giving me this opportunity to delve into the Upanishads. Um, to cover the Upanishads will take an entire uh, semester to even scratch the surface, a full you know, uh, t- uh, 10 weeks to do it, um, to go through the various aspects and to discuss and to read the different passages deeply. It's, it's really quite enjoyable. It's, it's a great uh, joy to study the Upanishads. Um, but hopefully, uh, considering that uh, we do obviously don't have all those many weeks uh, to do it, I hope that today you have gotten at least a little appreciation of why the Upanishads are such extraordinary literature. Even though we don't spend too much time studying them outside of the Isha Upanishad, um, all of the Upanishads are extraordinary. And there is a reason that they form the very foundation of the Vedanta philosophy that all of us belong to, uh, this Vedantic tradition that we belong to, and that even Lord Krishna himself um, uh, quotes and pays his respects to, uh, as does Srimad Bhagavatam. These Upanishads are very special, and I hope you achieved some appreciation for uh, their unique qualities. That's the first thing that we discussed today, the uniqueness of the Upanishads, uh, their method of teaching. That was the second thing that we discussed today, and the uh, variety of ways in which their content, their philosophy is understood by the different acharyas. So uniqueness, method of teaching, and content. These were the three areas that I tried to um, uh, highlight with just a brief introduction to each, uh, just the main highlights there. So thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, The session is now over for those who want to go. If anyone would like to stay uh, for more informal uh, question and answers, you're welcome to. I'm happy to stay uh, uh, longer. But um, anyone who wants to go, please don't hesitate uh, to leave. If you have, if you need to go, 